In the summer of 2021, my wife and I embarked on our first cross-country overland expedition. During those five weeks, we covered over 8,000 miles as we made our way from Connecticut to California, then north to Washington State, before returning to the East Coast. It was an adventure of a lifetime. 12 national parks, 25 nights in our tent, and more lifelong memories than I can count. It's been two years since that trip, and now we've returned to the one state that captured our hearts like no other. This is our Colorado expedition. This series of Varsity Overland is supported by Diodynamics, Rollercam, Rocky Talkie Mountain Radio, and Northeast ORV, Connecticut's premier vehicle outfitter. We'll be making this journey in our 2021 Chevy Colorado ZR2, affectionately named Goose. It's seen a few lighting and armor upgrades since its last touch Colorado soil, courtesy of our friends over at Northeast ORV in Portland, Connecticut. But more on the truck build later. Now, let's kick off the first leg of this adventure with a seven hour drive from Connecticut to Pennsylvania and our first campsite of the trip. So we made it to our first official campsite of the Colorado expedition. We are in the Allegheny National Forest of Pennsylvania, and this is a really cool spot right here next to this creek. We'll park it here for tonight. We're going to break down, take everything out, see whether or not stuff moved during transit, find a new home for any of our gear if we have to, and then uh, start transforming goose into camping mode. My wife, Michelle, will be the lead navigator and chef on this trip, while our dog, Pepper, will focus most of her attention on getting up into the tent because she's too good to lay on the ground. We'll be testing out a new camp configuration over the coming weeks due to the recent addition of an Overland Vehicle Systems 270 degree awning to the bed rack. Speaking of the bed rack, our trusted Yakima Overhaul HD rack and accessories will be experiencing its second cross-country outing. Topping off the rear of the truck is an iCamper SkyCamp 2.0. It is the first and only rooftop tent we have ever used and has sheltered us from numerous stormy nights over the past three years. Other, more recent additions to the build include a Fab Four's hidden winch front bumper with a 12,000 pound synthetic winch and Factor 55 Fairlead. Two pair of Diodynamics Amber SS3 pods used as fog and ditch lights. A Midland GMRS radio to communicate with our Rocky Talkies on the trail and a couple Front Runner Wolfpack cargo boxes atop the Prince who designed roof rack for extra storage. Lastly, we have the AEV snorkel, or raised air intake if you're feeling fancy. This will come in handy very soon as we drive through the dust of Southern Colorado, which might as well be New Mexico.
So what are we looking forward to most about this trip? Well, that's a big question. There's actually a long list of things that we've been looking forward to as far as Colorado is concerned, but I think I can narrow it down to two or three. Um, biggest thing that we're looking forward to is revisiting the site where we got engaged. I proposed to my wife in Colorado, so that's kind of a big deal to return to the uh, San Isabel National Forest and get to see that exact spot. Um, it was also the last trip that we took cross country with um, our old dog. And uh, there, there'll be some nostalgic moments up in the mountains being able to kind of like, hopefully, you know, feel her presence and kind of just enjoy uh, the memories that we made in Colorado uh, now that she's no longer with us. And then I guess to top everything off, it's the start of summer. We're just looking forward to some great weather and uh, just being able to finally slow down, relax, and just and, and enjoy an adventure that we've been looking forward to for about two years now. Unfortunately, our summer excitement would have to be postponed on account of rain. So we packed up our wet things the next morning and headed west to our next stop in Indiana. One of the benefits about driving through multiple states in a single day is that it's very likely you'll experience a change in weather. And by the time we arrived at our second campsite that night, it was clear that summer was back on track. So what do you think? I think it's a good spot. I think, I think it'll do for the night. It doesn't have any uh, water or, you know, like a river like last night, but this is only one place, one stop on our, on our trip towards Colorado. So when you're doing this, can't be too picky. Got to settle with whatever you come across. And to be honest, this is a pretty, pretty decent spot. It's wide open. It's got some really cool lighting with the uh, sun coming through the trees at the moment. There is a little rabbit that's running around. I'm gonna have to take care of uh, take care of the dog. Make sure she doesn't have a little snack with that rabbit. But I think it'll do for the night. And by it'll do for the night, what I mean is let me drive around with my tent open until I find the perfect position for the truck. Don't try this at home, kids. The uh, campsite we used last night in Indiana, there were a couple questionable plants surrounding our tent, surrounding that site. And once we left and got service, Michelle was able to do a little research and pretty much almost possibly, maybe 99%, we're kind of sure, confirm that it might have been poison ivy or poison sumac or poison oak or something. So between us walking around it and the dog, we're pretty much just waiting for the poison ivy bomb to drop. So, stopped at this uh, rest stop, do a little cleanup, and just keep our fingers crossed because we both are severely allergic to poison ivy, so. Fortunately, we left Indiana without suffering any allergic reactions and found ourselves at a private campground in Missouri. During this trip, we'll see a variety of campsites from free dispersed camping to campgrounds with reservations like this one. There's pros and cons to both, which I'll mention periodically. 
In this instance, we were able to meet some cool new people interested in this rooftop tent thingy on the truck and use the Wi-Fi to check the forecast, which wasn't pretty. So we decided to leave our campsite at 3 o'clock in the morning before the storm started, instead of trying to break down our tent and everything else in the rain and wind. Okay, it's like a scene from a scary movie. A storm is brewing. We're in the middle of Missouri, almost over the border into Kansas. The rain is about to start. Did I mention it's 4.30 in the morning? And we've been driving since 3.30. After a few hours of driving through the storm, we passed into Kansas, which is where the excitement of overland travel really started to pick up. Well, we just arrived in the Cimarron National Grasslands in Kansas after almost a 10 hour drive from the center of Missouri to southwestern Kansas. And uh, the drive actually wasn't that bad. A lot of people talk about how Kansas is one of those like flyover states. There's not a whole lot to look at. Um, it's just wide open land. And because of that, some people find it boring. But honestly, the drive here I found to be pretty cool. It was the first point of the trip, and there's always a point in like, like every trip, there's, there's always a point like this, where the terrain and the geography starts to change just enough to make you go, oh yeah, I am definitely not home anymore. And that's, uh, that's kind of what the drive through Kansas felt like. It was just flat, just wide open everywhere. You could just see for miles and miles and miles, um, which is kind of ironic because I kept thinking in the back of my mind, we're going to be in Colorado pretty soon. And that is not going to be the case in Colorado because of how mountainous it is. So we arrived in the grass grasslands and uh, we did actually find a potential campsite that was beautiful. Um, people say you can't overland in Kansas, but you can't overland in Kansas. Um, but it was uh, it was just a little bit difficult to get the truck level, the tent level. The sun wasn't at the right spot. It would have been beaten down on us. There were just a couple factors playing in. We have the dog with us. There were some bees flying around. It was just, it was a thing. So we're at a campground, again, in the grasslands, kind of chilling out for the last night before we actually make it to Colorado. Tomorrow will be our first day in Colorado. This is our final, final campsite on the drive out. And I cannot wait to see what Colorado has in store. views of the Cimarron grasslands were incredible, and although we'd often think of dense forest or tall mountains when planning for this adventure, there's something to be said about finding yourself in a completely unexpected environment along the way. Beautiful surprises like this are what make overland travel so exciting. After driving what felt like the longest, least maintained dirt road in existence, we stopped to fuel up at the only location our nearly empty gas tank could reach. 
Nothing like poor planning and lost GPS signal to keep things interesting. Excuse me. Looking for the best overlanding spots in Colorado. Anybody help me out? No. Anybody? No. Hey. Do you not do you not speak English? Is there something to say? Meh. This area, just five minutes from the state line, is known primarily for agriculture and cattle ranching, dating as far back as the early 1920s and 30s. Some old ranch homes, like this one, were abandoned years ago due to repeated dust storms. have arrived at a monument called Tripoint, which puts us in three different states at the same time. We got Colorado, Oklahoma, and New Mexico. Also known as the Preston Monument, named after one of the original surveyors of these state lines, Levi S. Preston, this location is one of roughly 38 locations where three U.S. state lines intersect. And although we had to cross from Kansas to Colorado just to reach this monument, we are considering this point as the official start to our journey through the 38th state of the U.S. Colorado, here we come. So we just set out this thermocell, hoping that it's gonna deter some of the bugs. Technically, it's only meant for mosquitoes, but there are so many bugs here. Huh, Pepper? There's so many bugs here. We have to try something. Sometimes the view makes you go to extremes just to enjoy it. We love this. We love camping, don't we? Last time we were in Colorado, there were not, ah, uh, there were not this many bugs, although we are a few weeks early. 
What? The is, bugs are swarming her food. Is it? Are you sure it's not like a uh, dog feeding ritual going on? <laughs> I just think that I don't want her to have bugs in her food. I feel bad. Now I've experienced the heat of Moab, Utah, camping in the middle of July. And I've also experienced the infestation of bugs that is hatching season in the spring next to a swamp in New York. And let me tell you, this is a uh, pretty strong combination of both. So I don't know how long we're gonna last hanging out around the truck at camp. We can't do anything. They're like those tiny little gnats. Not quite flies, not quite mosquitoes, but they love just like flying into your eyes, flying into your ears. So we might climb up into the tent and uh, wait it out, sit inside the eye camper, wait it out, see if when the sun sets a little bit and the temperature cools down, if the bugs will start to disappear. But I am trying real hard to enjoy every last second of this gorgeous Colorado Canyon view. Are you really wearing a jacket? I am. It's the only thing that I have packed with a hood. And currently it is making the bugs stay out of my ears. So I'm gonna sweat, but I'm not gonna have a bunch of buzzing in my ears. Unfortunately, we had to leave that spot pretty early. As soon as we got out of the tent, the bugs started to swarm us again. So we're making our way to a place called Skyline Drive, trying to find some dinosaur tracks. And hopefully along the way, we're gonna stop and give Goose a bath because the truck is covered in mud and clay and it's just it's disgusting. up there. Feeling more like Colorado. Skyline Drive, located in Canyon City, Colorado, is iconic for its incredible views and historical significance. Here, fossilized dinosaur tracks can be seen imprinted into the cliffside, created by Ankylosaurus over 100 million years ago. Prehistoric creatures like these captured my imagination as a child, often leading to long walks through the woods pretending to find real-life dinosaurs in my own backyard. And while the scenery at our campsite the night before was certainly beautiful, 
This was the first glimpse into the mountainous views we'd been yearning for. We just finished up our drive on Skyline Drive, which was gorgeous, by the way. Uh, very accessible, anyone in a, in a vehicle can do it. You don't need four wheel drive. The whole thing is paved, but it was, it was incredible. The views were great. Um, so we are headed towards Colorado Springs right now to kind of like restock, refuel, and just get some much needed R&R. The next day, we drove up into the mountains just outside of Colorado Springs to explore the Pike National Forest. At any point in time, if you asked us what we loved most about Colorado, this would be our answer. Is day seven of the expedition which means we've officially been on the road for a week and after we left Colorado Springs we found ourselves in Pike National Forest and this is one of those big significant spots that I've mentioned previously on the trip because this National Forest is actually where Michelle and I got engaged I proposed to Michelle here at a spot called Eagles Eagles Nest no it's called Eagle's Nest. I, I was gonna say Eagle's Landing. I'm not cutting that out, let's keep going. It's called Eagle's Nest and uh, we're gonna visit that in the morning. There's a potential for a little bit of rain overnight, although we have some clear skies right now. So the condition for night number two in Colorado is so much better than night number one in Colorado. We did revisit our campsite that we used two years ago. Um, and we just kind of determined that there was a lot of overgrowth and uh, it just seemed a little bit more dirty than it did last time. There was a lot of water, standing water, maybe more bugs. Filmed a little bit, took a couple pictures there just for nostalgia's sake, but then we moved deeper into the mountain to find this spot. So yeah, we're setting up camp. We already have the tent open, um, eating some food, using the drone a little bit just enjoying, I think, what will be the first really relaxing night of camping here in Colorado. What are you doing? You trying to get up into the tent? Is that where you wanna go? It does not take Pepper very long to investigate the campsite and then immediately try to go up into the tent so that she can lay down and sleep. What are you looking at? What do you see out there? So we had a pretty interesting night last night. It was a wild lightning storm that lasted for hours. It was like fireworks, just constantly. No thunder, no rain, just a cloudy sky and lights, lights, lights flashing like every 30 seconds it felt like. Um, but thankfully, everything else was pretty calm. Everything worked out. Slept through the night, it was nice and cool. 
and we got to enjoy kind of like a restful, peaceful morning here in the forest. So what I'm doing now is I'm going through and checking all the bolts that uh, hold the tent in place, hold the bed rack down, because the road to get out here, I don't want to say was difficult, but there's a lot of washboard and there's a lot of potholes. So whenever you go through a long road like that, several miles long, you want to go through and just double check everything. I already noticed that one of the knobs that keeps my tidal cover in place came loose a little bit, you know? So if you leave that unattended for the next two weeks, bad things could happen. So I'm just going to go through and start checking all the bolts for everything that keeps everything secure. And uh, hopefully we don't have any issues. After checking everything over on the truck, we made our way to Eagle's Landing Lookout, where I had proposed to Michelle two years prior. Was it necessary to plan a five-week, 8,000-mile cross-country overland expedition just to distract her from my potential proposal plans? Yes. Yes, it was. Now this is pod racing. So here's a useful tip when you come up to a new campsite that you've never been to before, especially in a new environment or new terrain, do a thorough walkthrough of the surrounding area because you never know what you might come across. And this morning, Pepper found what looks to be the remains of a deer carcass or something like that. Honestly, it just looks like it's the pelt. And although we did walk around the campsite a lot when we arrived here yesterday, it still eluded us. And you can see the truck is right over there. So always be sure, especially if you have like pets or young kids, you always want to investigate large area around your campsite just to be sure that you don't stumble across anything or your child or your pet the same thing happened to us when we were camping in Wyoming we arrived to a campsite kind of late and didn't realize the next morning that there was a big old pile of bones and some sort of maybe like elk carcass near our campsite I get it sometimes you arrive to camp and all you want to do is set up sit down and relax but you always got to keep yourself safe and be aware. Later that morning, we departed from the San Isabel National Forest to explore a unique landscape not normally associated with Colorado, the Great Sand Dunes National Park. After leaving the park, we explored another iconic Colorado landmark, North Clear Creek Falls. 
This 100-foot waterfall is what remains of the ancient Lake Creed, named after the nearby town of Creed, and was formed after a volcanic crater erupted, then filled with water, 27 million years ago. The same eruption contributed to the formation of the San Juan Mountains. After a long afternoon of hunting for a campsite in the Rio Grande National Forest, thanks to some poor, uh, poor instructions on I Overlander, we are thinking that we will find a spot in the Rio Grande National Forest campground. Because besides the uh, wandering, we also kind of got wrapped in in some of the beautiful views here in this national forest. It kind of goes through some rur rural areas uh, and it's obviously a paved road, but I mean the views, this is what I think of when I think of Colorado. So we're making our way towards that campground, hoping to uh, have enough time to park it, make some dinner, and then just call it a night. It's the kind of night where you don't even break out the large propane tank. You don't break out the table. Make minimal food for dinner. What do we have in mac and cheese? <laughs> mac and cheese, bacon mac and cheese, which is okay, I guess. And then once that's done, we're just gonna go to bed. We are at the uh, National Park, National Forest Campground. But at least I think we won't have to worry about the animal carcass we found at this morning's campsite. it works yeah I guess that works all right here we go I can hear you can you hear me Roger. all right so there isn't a whole lot going on here we just entered the uh, San Juan National Forest and there's a little washout so we're gonna let Michelle have a little fun Yeah, maybe just come right towards me where I am now. You said cut right, like cut to passenger? Yes. All right, sounds good. Are you recording? I am. Straight on, just cut to your side a little bit. Yep, just cut to your side a little bit more. 
All right. All right, nice and slow. You're good. Little gas, just a little bit. There you go. Turn the passenger a little bit more. Perfect. She did it. And look at that in the background. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, I love you. Now don't leave me this time. I'd never leave you. So unfortunately our hopeful campsite that we wanted to use was taken so we drove a little further up the trail and we found this partially cleared pull off and so Michelle is going to demonstrate her incredible backing up driving ability and back down this trail by herself no radio communication no nothing What did you do? What did you do? Did you roll and poop? Now you get a bath, huh? Yeah. I know it's uncomfortable, but it's your own fault. Bring a dog over landing, they said. It'll be great, they said. Stay. Well, it's been an eventful few days here in Colorado, um, and I wish I was saying that in a good way. Besides the fact that we went to the Great Sand Dunes National Park yesterday and the uh, Mesa Verde National Park today, which was beautiful, by the way, uh, we've also had to contend with freezing temperatures this morning in the Rio Grande National Forest, which kind of blew my mind because it's June. We woke up to uh, 29 degrees this morning totally not prepared for that. Um, the water pour almost didn't work because of how, how frozen it was. And uh, tonight we are in the San Juan National Forest, hoping to make our way tomorrow a little bit, a little bit further into the San Juan uh, mountains. But we are in a spot that we kind of just decided to settle for because it's Saturday night. We were at the National Park for quite a while. And once we made our way into the forest, a lot of the spots that we came across were already taken. So we settled for this spot, which happened to be, of course, very buggy. So we're surrounded by flies and, and mosquitoes yet again here in Colorado. Uh, if I had to make one suggestion to anybody venturing out to Colorado, it might be to do it a little bit later in summer. Because apparently this type of season is when the bugs are hatching and flying around and the temperatures haven't quite warmed up just enough overnight. So we're making do. We're still enjoying ourselves, making the best of this campsite. And hopefully tomorrow we'll see some amazing views throughout the mountains. We found this campground in the San Juan National Forest while following the Dolores River. We had stopped at two previous dispersed sites along the way, but felt they were too close to the main road to offer any real privacy. Here, we were able to finally kick back and relax. The sun was shining, the sound of the river was calming, and for once, there weren't any annoying bugs.
using this campsite has been great. It's got a river, check. It's safe, big check. And it was available when none of the other dispersed sites that we came across were, check. So I think what would have kept me from using this campsite is the fact that it is a campground. And I don't think that's okay. In fact, when it comes to something like overlanding, a lot of people have their own interpretation and there's a lot that you can find online as to what the definition is of overlanding. Uh, and that kind of bothers me. Personally, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me if you are in a modified vehicle living out of a rooftop tent in Antarctica for a month or if you are sleeping in the bed of your truck at the campground. I don't care. I'm still gonna call this overlanding. We're still self-reliant out of our vehicle. We are still traveling a decent distance. Um, and I believe there shouldn't just be one correct way to do it. Everyone is entitled to their own style of adventure. Using this campground definitely expanded my interpretation of what overlanding means. Locations such as these allow travelers to enjoy the national forest while reducing their impact on wild places. And the revenue brought in helps support conservation efforts. Another benefit of this campsite is that we didn't have to spend hours driving through the mountains to find it. And instead, we're able to dedicate some time to equipment maintenance. Like fixing the crack in our water port nozzle, caused by freezing temperatures a few nights prior. It was shaping up to be a peaceful afternoon. That is, until the drone decided it wanted to go for a swim. I finally get to join the cool kids group of people who have crashed their drones. Partial human error, partial drone error, but it happened right here in the Dolores River. So I flew my drone out right past this tree in this open area over the river. It's not particularly windy right now, but my drone hasn't been able to update the app in about two days because we haven't had any service. And when it does that, the drone likes to just kind of wander on its own. So I tried to correct that when I pushed it forward. It just continued that flight pattern forward. Ended up hitting this tree right here. And as soon as it did, went straight into the river. And this river is moving. So unfortunately, there's no way for me to find it or salvage it. And on top of that, the SIM card is inside the drone. Now, there's a glimmer of hope because the drone does back up its footage while in use on the controller. And the controller does have a bunch of my footage from the last two or three days on it. It's just not great quality. So. I'm probably still going to try and save that, download it, use it for the uh, series here with our Colorado expedition. But at the moment, I am unsure as to how good it's going to look. So, first drone in the graveyard.
So full disclosure, we uh, spent the last two nights in a hotel in Grand Junction. It was, it was much needed. Um, I wasn't feeling well. Pepper wasn't feeling well. We actually had to uh, call the vet back home on the East Coast and have a prescription sent for us. Um, and then on top of that, I wanted to check out a Best Buy and maybe a couple other electronic stores in Grand Junction to see if I could possibly replace my drone. And would you uh, know it that there are no drones. Everything is just completely sold out. So no drone, still filming on the road. Not gonna have any aerial shots for a while. But yeah, we are in the White River National Forest now. We got another, another uh, campsite at a campground just to kind of keep things comfortable as we get back on the road, entering the final leg here. We are on part three of our trip. So spend the night here, enjoy the water. There is a really nice river. And uh, tomorrow we'll hit the Rocky Mountain National Park, which I'm really looking forward to. On our way to the Rocky Mountain National Park, we stop for some coffee in the town of Carbondale. Too often, overlanders spend so much effort getting away from civilization and other people. But in fact, it's moments like this, when we're exposed to a beautiful small town surrounded by mountains, that I gain true perspective. This is why it's important to stop and go to the bathroom every chance you can and also make sure you have plenty of gas even if you feel like you don't need it because you'll never know when you're parked at a railroad crossing to watch a train drive by for 20 minutes just so that the caboose can stop right in front of you. Our plan for today was to visit the Rocky Mountain National Park. But unfortunately, we didn't realize it's the only park in the US that requires reservations to be made 24 hours in advance. So instead, we ventured into the mountains just outside of the town of Grand Lake to search for our next campsite. This area of the National Forest was devastated by a wildfire in 2020, started by human causes. And thanks to our dog, Pepper, we were reminded yet again why it's important to check your surroundings at camp. So it's about 6.30 here in the burnt forest. Just woke up, got out of the tent, already getting swarmed by mosquitoes. And we ended up getting a storm last night. Some rain and thunder came rolling over the mountains just behind us around nine o'clock and continued for a few hours. I'm very thankful that the tent is a hard shell hard shell rooftop tent because it diverted a lot of the wind. 
but it was still noisy and uh, I think I ended up falling asleep around like 2 a.m. It is day 16 and I am definitely getting ready to be home. I'm missing my bed, missing the comfort of being able to just chill out on the couch, not be wet, not be cold. Still beautiful, still a really nice place. But I'm also just about ready for it to be over. And I am very thankful for this roller cam strap, which was the only thing securing my cargo box to the top of this rack last night during the storm. Not only did I forget to attach the latch that I use on the side, but I also, in my hurry to get up into the tent because of all the mosquitoes, I also forgot to even secure the lid. So the lid is completely separate right now. The only thing that I have on here is this roller cam strap. Still kind of loose because I was trying to fish my hand in here last night just to grab what I needed really quick so we could run up inside the tent. But even with the wind, the roller cam strap was able to keep not only the lid on, but the box in place. So, we just packed up in such a hurry. We're just trying to get away from all these mosquitoes. I'm wearing my new Colorado shirt that I picked up while we're here on the road, trying to keep my, my morale high, I'm trying to feel like it's not all as ter terrible as I made it out to be. The sun is shining, so it is nice. I could do without the bugs. This is not this is not something that we're, you know, new to. We are familiar with being on the road for a long period of time. In fact, we've done a trip at least twice this long. Uh, we're at the end of our second week now, and we did a trip in 2021 that was five weeks. So there's just something a little different about this trip. It's feeling a little exhausting. There's rain on the forecast still, unfortunately, today. Um, despite the sun being out right now. So we're gonna get out of here, head into the park, hopefully enjoy some of that before more rain comes down. The next day, we learned of two bison preserves just outside of Denver that protect the last remaining bison in Colorado. Seeing as how these giant hairy cows happen to be my favorite animal, we had no choice but to investigate. So we just had an experience, crossed over the border from Colorado into Kansas, heading back to the East Coast. And on one of the interstates, we were stopped by a giant white dog in the middle of the road. Nobody was claiming it. It looked like it was hot. It looked like it didn't know where it was. It was kind of confused and obviously it's in the middle of the road. So Michelle and I pull over and we try to coax the dog out of the road. Luckily, a tractor trailer truck was coming and happened to slow down and stop traffic right in front of the dog to help us. Michelle put down a bowl of water. We kept pepper in the truck, obviously. We didn't know how that was gonna turn out. But we put down a bowl of water. We were able to coax the dog over to us. Then Michelle calls the local police department. And what did they say? They said, this is a frequent flyer 
and if you go to under the underpass that was ahead of us, it turns into a dirt road, and that dog belongs to the farmhouse that's on the left. So, instead of telling us how to help the dog, or sending out like an animal control, or contacting the, the family, or anything like that, the woman, <laughs> what did she say? She said, I know this sounds bad, but just let it go. It'll find its way home. Let it go. Because we nearly hit the dog in the middle of the road on this busy interstate. Just let it go. Let it go. What? No way. We did not let it go. We did not let it go. <laughs> um, we ended up very cautiously and, and calmly. I leashed the dog and uh, walked the dog under the underpass, basically in the direction that we thought the officer was telling us to go. And while I was walking, you could very obviously see the dog's footprints in the mud from where it came from, because the dog was just covered in mud. Um, so we brought it back to the dirt road, we brought it back to its property, we were able to get it back to where it belonged. Very sweet dog. Um, in these situations, you wanna do the right thing, but you also need to be very careful because dogs can react in very unpredictable ways. Uh, if there was any inkling that the dog was going to be aggressive or, you know, that we could put the dog in more danger, we just would have had to kind of let it go. But the dog was very calm, very sweet, and uh, just looked really tired, to be honest. So, got it back where it belonged, and now we have, we have a story that we can share with you and with everybody else once we get back home. We thought that the drive home, you always think that the drive home from your from your trip it's going to be boring but it's not. it's it's not there's always something that keeps it interesting i guess well it is the end of the colorado expedition this is day 18 of the trip and we crossed over from colorado into kansas earlier this morning we are at a campsite that we chose in a campground. Beautiful campground. Look at this site. Of all of the dispersed wild camping sites that we used, we actually found that some of the best sites were in campgrounds, ironically. And that kind of plays along uh, with an idea or a thought that I have about this trip. I've learned a lot during this trip. And one of the biggest things that I learned was I shouldn't let the stigma of campground use kind of like ruin an overland experience you know people can adventure any way they want to and to limit the use of of campgrounds because it's not going to be considered true overlanding is definitely kind of silly some of the best spots that we got like i just said are from campgrounds and honestly it, it makes the whole situation safer it makes it a heck of a lot less stressful. I mean, there were some times when we were driving for hours and hours and hours just to arrive at a dispersed site that we had hoped to use and found that it was taken, you know, or that the trail was a little more hairy than we expected it to be. Um, so I've definitely learned to kind of swallow my pride a little bit and just say like, yeah, the use of campgrounds is, is completely legitimate. Also, when you use a campground and you reserve your spot, you get to do something that you can't do at dispersed sites, which is actually interact with other people around you. And we actually met some pretty cool people. And when you do use those campgrounds, you bring in money to those areas and you're able to fund either small businesses like those campground owners, or you bring money to the national forest. So, this will be the end of our Colorado expedition. We do plan on leaving this campsite in the morning pretty early and uh, probably trying to make one or two really long drives. In fact, I think we're gonna try to do two 10 hour days just to get back to the East Coast as fast as possible. So with that being said, appreciate you sticking around. Appreciate you following along on the journey. If you haven't seen all of the other Colorado expedition vi uh, videos, please, go to the YouTube channel and give them all a watch, a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel so that you can see more of these extended 
expedition type of ventures or just some of our product reviews. I'm definitely going to have a lot to say about the products we've been using on this trip. So look for a couple upcoming videos to see how we might have to change things around because I learned a lot about myself, but we also learned a lot about the vehicle and how we can make improvements. Thanks for sticking around and watching everything and uh, I hope to see you on the next adventure. Thank you so much for watching and joining us on this adventure. We appreciate your interest as well as the support from companies who help make these videos possible.